It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. What a journey it's been through the Book of Mormon over the past year, and what a year it's been for a journey through the Book of Mormon. David F. Holland joins us in this episode to talk about his brief theological introduction to the final book, the Book of Moroni. Spencer Fluman returns as guest host, having just wrapped up editing on Dr. Holland's forthcoming volume. It's part of the Maxwell Institute's Brief Theological Introduction series. You can find out more information about the series at mi.byu.edu slash brief, and we hope that this volume and the rest of them will be available by the end of the year. Dr. Holland joined us over Zoom. He's the John Bartlett Professor of New England Church History at Harvard Divinity School and Director of Graduate Studies in Religion at Harvard University. We're thankful to him and to all the authors who've contributed to this series, and of course, to all of you, the listeners and the readers who've been taking this theological journey with us. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. It's David F. Holland and Spencer Fluman talking about a brief theological introduction to Moroni. Welcome, friends. Uh, my name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute, and I am guest hosting the uh, Maxwell Institute podcast today. And I am with Dr. David Holland of the Harvard Divinity School, who has written a brief theological introduction to Moroni as part of our Brief Theological Introductions series. David, welcome. Have you been on the podcast before? Is this your maiden voyage? This is it. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be with you always, Spencer. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this particular book. I've read it more than once. And, uh, I'm sorry. No, don't don't apologize. It's uh, it's it's tremendous, and I've seen it develop, and uh, I quite love it. And I'm excited for it to be in the world. We're hoping uh, that it appears just before Christmas. That's the plan. Uh, stocking stuffers everywhere. Uh, <laughs> that's that's uh, uh, step step below coal. I'm afraid. So. <laughs> If our if our timing's right, it'll be a it'll be a marvelous conclusion to a remarkable series, and so I'm excited to talk about it today. David, you're you're trained as a historian. You're not a theologian by training. Maybe maybe you're a theologian on the side, but uh, you come to this with a, a slightly different set of skills. Uh, tell us what it was like as a historian to uh, shift gears to to write something seriously theological. Well, interestingly enough, part of my historiographical commitment as a scholar of history is that everyone's a theologian. It used to be that in the study of American religious history and the study of the history of religion generally, the category of theology was reserved for elite, highly trained, quite rarefied thinkers who participated in a kind of discourse that was often inaccessible to regular people. And just about everything that I've written as a historian has been premised on the assumption that you don't have to be an Oxford or Cambridge trained theologian in order to participate in a theological conversation. And so in a sense, I'm sort of living out the historiographical commitment that's informed my work by jumping into this conversation myself and saying, you know, I might not have the technical training in theology. Uh, I might not be deeply enmeshed in theological conversations in my professional life, but I am uh, a participant in the human experience. And I reflect on the meaning and the significance and the cosmological context of these lives that we live. And I think that makes you and me and everybody that we encounter at some level a theologian. And so I do believe that we all have the opportunity to take our place in this discussion. And so I was grateful for the invitation and the chance to live out what has been a longstanding commitment of mine. It's also very gratifying because I work on theologians as a historian. I work on both technically trained and classically categorized theologians and popular theologians of any variety of stripes. Uh, and so I love the chance to think about them in the context of the Book of Mormon. So I get a chance to talk about Jonathan Edwards in relation to the Book of Mormon or Friedrich Schleiermacher in relation to the Book of Mormon. These people that I write about and teach about uh, 
but rarely have the chance to connect to my own devotional life. And this was an invitation to bring these sort of figures that I engage with historically into a contemporary, live, living conversation with me theologically. And I found that really rewarding. Your response is really interesting to me because it, one, it authorizes me to think of myself as a popular theologian, which I just, I, I just discovered that right now as, as we're talking. So that's great. I'm going to claim that title too. But the other piece is about uh, Latter-day Saints and our own community. Because on the one hand, um, theology can seem a little bit like a scary word. It sounds rarefied. It sounds overly academic. And we've we've got some negative uh, connotations with theology in our tradition, some with good reasons, some maybe not. But you're modeling, and I hope the series models, a kind of invitation for Latter-day Saints to call what they're doing when they think hard about Scripture, when they talk in their Sunday school classes about Scripture, when they wonder how things connect, that they're doing a kind of theology. Does that help us? I think it does. I think it does. I think the reason why we're resistant is because we have this deep commitment to living revelation and the idea that you don't need a set-apart category of academically trained theologians to develop the doctrine. We have living prophets and apostles that do that work with divine authority rather than academic credential. And that's one of the things I love about our faith. It's one of the things that I love about being a Latter-day Saint. But I think that's a pretty narrow conception of theology and what a theologian is and does. Jim Faulkner's got a great line in his volume on Mosiah about uh, how the prophetic figures in the Book of Mormon don't do theology, they declare doctrine and they invite us to do the theological work of making sense of that and to figuring out its systematic application in our lives and in our thought. And so in a sense, the existence of prophets and apostles who declare is in fact an invitation for the membership of the church to always be doing theology, not in opposition to revelatory authority, which is sometimes the way it gets described historically, not not necessarily in our faith, but sort of just generally in Christian history, uh, not in opposition, but as the necessary complement and consequence of a living stream of revelation, that as we receive this, and as we think about it in its kind of historical sequence and in its larger kind of cultural application, we have a lot of revelatory sources, scripture, prophet, living inspiration, patriarchal blessings. I mean, we, we believe that Revelation is this broad and vast sea of possibility that we all have to do the work of theologizing that steady flow of light and truth to make it meaningful and applicable in our own lives. And so rather than seeing the Latter-day Saint tradition as uniquely resistant to the concept of theology, I think if conceived of in the way that I'm suggesting, it's actually a pretty profound invitation for us to jump into that theologizing conversation. Marvelous. Let's, uh, let's, let's jump into the uh, materials that you had to wrestle with over the, the past uh, months. Uh, the Book of Moroni, no pressure, but you've, you have to wrestle with this concluding, uh, dramatic kind of conclusion narratively, theologically, uh, for, for the whole book of Scripture as we've come to read it and love it. You, you argue in the book that the ordering of those materials that we get from Moroni is itself important, that it's, it doesn't seem accidental to you. Uh, we, we've got this mix of things that, that we get, and, and for you, you see a kind of order there. So do a couple things for us. Would you remind us what we have for Moroni when we get to his um, writings, and then... Uh, what might we take from the, 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 the order that we receive them? Sure. Um, I do think that uh, a number of places in the Book of Mormon are ordered for theological or at least doctrinal purpose. And some of my fellow authors in this series you know, have, have made that case, beginning with uh, Joseph Spencer's you know, opening volume uh, with First Nephi, who, who, uh, which talks so... Uh, compellingly about the structure of that book. So I don't think Moroni is unique in this regard. I do think there's a bit of a 
kind of tradition and pattern in the Book of Mormon to, to order these materials with a kind of larger message in mind. But Moroni's book is quite distinctive in the sense that he is not really a chronicler of an era. Unlike his authorial counterparts throughout the book, he's really quite disengaged with what's happening around him. He's on the run, he's isolated, he's on his own, he's not watching, he's not recording what's happening in these other groups or these roving bands or you know how the history is unfolding around him. And so he's kind of liberated sounds like a positive term. I don't I don't necessarily mean it positively. I'm I'm not sure he would have seen it positively. Uh, but he is sort of, in that sense, uh, not in the position to chronicle his generation. He knows a lot more about the past than he knows about what's going on in his present. And indeed, he knows a lot more about the future than what's going on in his present. And so we get a lot more about the past and the future than we get about his present. And so what we get is this collection of artifacts. You know, it opens with him kind of describing his circumstance his uncertainty, surprised to be alive. He doesn't know where this is headed. He doesn't know how it ends. He knows that Jesus is the Christ, and that's the motivation to stay alive, keep his testimony alive, literally and figuratively. And so he knows this one great truth, that Jesus is the Christ, and everything else is kind of swirling in uncertainty around him. So once he lays that foundation, the very next step in, in what we have is Moroni chapter 2, is to start talking about the ordinances, which seems like such an interesting move for him, you know, given the sort of existential crisis that he's finding himself in, that he starts talking about, you know, how you confer the gift of the Holy Ghost and how you ordain a teacher and a priest and how you bless the sacrament. Um, and I think that is really quite telling. I think, for one thing, it elevates the importance of the ordinances as that kind of move in a moment of chaos uh, and in the book, I describe this both as kind of a theological move and maybe a psychological move, right? That in the same way that starving people dream of feasts, Moroni is dreaming of the well-ordered Christian community. And that rests on a foundation of, you know, carefully preserved ordinances. So I think it's really quite significant that he launches right into that as he describes his own kind of dire straits. And there are a lot of things we could say about the way he describes those ordinances. I think they're quite rich in their description. But he's describing ordinances from 400 years earlier. He's talking about the way Christ instituted these ordinances at the time of his visit to the Lamanites and the Nephites. And so he's very historically aware and committed to this idea of preserving these. Right? If they've been preserved for 400 years, and now he's going to preserve them for millennia more, uh, as he anticipates the future readership of his book, he sees these things as stabilizing, as continuity, consistency, that's essential to the larger project of God's work in the world. And then these ordinances then lead up to a description of that community, and that's what we get in Moroni 6, after you know, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which describe these ordinances. Then we get this description of the church, and actually one more ordinance, which is baptism, described in, in chapter 6 doesn't describe the ordinance itself so much as the prerequisites or the requirements for participating in it, foremost among which is a broken heart and a contrite spirit, which is a discourse in and of itself. But that these ordinances are to lead to a community of caring. They are the kind of ordering foundation upon which something higher rests, and that is this connection of love, a group that will meet together oft and nourish each other with the good word of Christ and follow the spirit in their worship. And so you get this depiction of the community beginning with ordinances leading up through the emergence of the church. And then immediately on the heels of that, you get uh, Mormon's great sermon in Moroni 7, the sermon that we associate with the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, though I think it's about even more than that. I mean, that would be enough, but I think there's actually even more going on in that sermon. And so you sort of see this ordinances help inform the church. The church then prepares the soul to learn how to love purely. And that's the ultimate gift that comes at the end of Moroni 7, Mormon's sermon, is this gift of love. 
the pure love of Christ, which he bestows, which God bestows on all that are true followers of his son. So it does seem to me there's a kind of sequential logic there that builds up to this ultimate gift in his father's sermon. And I love this sort of the complexity of Moroni's approach here that he's telling history, he's describing community, and then he's declaring, you know, this great grace, the, the grace of love. Uh, that Christ gives us and that he calls on us to offer to others. And then we get these two really interesting letters, which in some ways seem sort of inexplicable. Why on the heels of this kind of building momentum yeah. to this culmination, do you suddenly get this discourse on infant baptism and then this really gut-wrenching description of what's going on in Mormon's moment? You know, this is, this is history to, to Moroni. Mormon's dead at this point. Why go back and provide this letter that describes this chaos that Mormon was living through. So these two letters function quite interestingly. Uh, and I, you know, I, I contend in the book and I, I you know, I, I stand by I, this suggestion that that letter on infant baptism that constitutes our Moroni chapter eight is in fact a warning against overreading the early chapters on the ordinances. Sort of the culminating point of Mormon's letter is beware of dead works. Beware of the idea that so much emphasis on the ordinance of baptism so that you're imposing it on children and you're condemning those who have not received it is in fact a misreading of this doctrine. So it's almost, you know, Moroni saying we begin with the ordinances and we move up through this great outpouring of love that ultimately results from this sequence but there's a kind of caveat. There's a kind of warning yeah. uh, that don't take this into the sort of rigid formalism of a doctrine of dead works. And infant baptism for Mormon is the ultimate expression of that. And so that then becomes the ultimate warning for Moroni, that caution against a misreading of that sequence that he described in chapters two through seven. And then in nine, following on eight, we get another letter. And this one kind of gives us that you know, the, the counter warning, beware of anarchy, beware of chaos. What Mormon describes is a people who have given up on order, given up on the structure, given up on the community. And you get this anarchic, you know, free for all of human depravity that has the most offensive, gut wrenching descriptions in the whole book. You know, cannibalism and sexual violence and, you know, the. Uh, murder of husbands in front of their wives and fathers in front of their children. I mean, the terrible, terrible stuff here. As if to say, you know, don't resist the formalism so much that you break down the structures of community love. And then finally, in chapter 10, you get Moroni's culminating testimony uh, in which he talks about the gifts of the spirit and Jesus Christ as the ultimate gift of our heavenly father and then describes himself as ascending up to heaven. And I, I think that imagery is so beautiful and poignant. You know, when, when, when the book of Moroni opens, you get this guy who's sort of kicking dust along the trail, you know, very pedestrian, very earthbound, very lost in many respects. And by the end of the book, he's soaring through heaven triumphantly. It's like the ultimate contrast of images. And I think for Moroni, it's a sort of description of what happens if somebody is true to this sequence that he's been describing. So that's that's my sense of the ordering. I do think that there's a there's a meaning to that uh, sequence, and and we need to pay attention to that structure in order to get the full intent of Moroni's message to us. Well, and you you've helped me. Um a lot as a reader uh, with that structure that makes sense to me. Uh, also helpful to me is the, not only do you help make sense of that structure and the way those letters seem like guardrails of, of a certain kind, but you've also given a kind of through line theologically to the book that you think helps us organize Moroni's, all of his activity as a, as a writer and as a theologian, as a, a, an observer, a witness. Uh, and that's that's the idea of the gift and and gifts, and you've uh, you've already used that word a couple of times in your response, and it and and for you that is a paramount kind of organizing word. You see him as quote a theologian of the gift. That's the way you frame Nephi. What prompted that for you, and and how does that idea of gifts or giving 
help us understand these chapters that we encounter at the end of the Book of Mormon? Part of it is um, just the frequency of word occurrence, uh, that the term gift appears so frequently, not just in the Book of Moroni, but any time Moroni appears in the Book of Mormon, uh, every time he appears, this word comes up. Title page, twice he describes the Book of Mormon as being translated by the gift and power of God, that it's a gift unto humanity. So right off the bat, and, and I know there's debate about whether Moroni is the author of the title page. I'm, I'm in the camp that is pretty convinced that he, he must be. So we've got the gift there. When he finishes, you know, his, uh, his father's book, that is the internal book of Mormon, it appears in his concluding you know, wrap up of his father's testimony. It appears when he wraps up the book of Ether, and then it appears throughout his own book. And if you just do a kind of a raw quantitative analysis, he uses the term more than any other Book of Mormon author, closely rivaled by his own father, which I think is kind of an interesting familial yeah. <laughs> rhetorical tendency there. You have a guess where he got it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So I think that's interesting, and it, it plays into you know one of my own kind of anchor points of testimony about the divinity of the book it goes all the way back to this sort of moment I had with Alma where you, I began to recognize as a teenager what I've come to call the authorial signature, you know, a kind of rhetorical tendency. Uh, and you see that in Moroni, again, not just in this book, but everywhere he appears. And so I thought, let's take a close look at this. And, you know, why, why does he keep using this term? And what does it signify? And it just dawns on me that both in his own testimonies and his work as a historian, as he's recovering, you know, the, the the ritual history of Christ's visit, and then in his, you know, selection of these materials from his father, and I do think that, you know, I, I do think there are conscious selection. He suggests that he, you know, pulled out those things that he thought was of most important, and lo and behold, it's a sermon about the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. So again, you know, the gifts come up, and then in his concluding testimony, you know, in chapter ten, the whole first half of that is about the gifts of the Spirit, explicitly stated. And then the transition to his concluding passage there is, you know, be partakers of the heavenly gift. You know, as if the whole concept of salvation is encapsulated in that idea of the gift. I mean, when you start to look at it, it's kind of overwhelming just how significant that giftedness of all of this is to Moroni. And... I think it helps us actually understand one of the great theological impasses or controversies of the entirety of Christian history, and that is this vexing relationship between grace and work. Uh, and I probably can't do it justice here, you know, in our conversation, but but hopefully I've gotten a little closer to it in the book. That part of that is resolved, or at least re it's resolved in a practical sense when we understand that both of those things are gifts. We often think about grace as the gift, in part because the, the word, you know, etymologically is connected, and work as some kind of intrinsic capacity for us, right? That we do the work and God gives the grace. But I actually think that there's at least theological resource within the Book of Moroni to suggest that we're better off recognizing the grace and the work as both gifts from God and given in particular proportion to our circumstance. And g the giver, God as the giver, capital G, has granted us the opportunity to work and has granted us the mercies of grace. And they come in different proportion as you would expect a thoughtful giver to give individualized gifts. You know, he is the great giver and that means he's given them to us to match our particular circumstance and need. And so there are moments when, you know, a circumstance in which I might be given the opportunity to work agency to choose and choice, uh, choose and change. And that is unique to me. And I might look at somebody else who, because of, you know, physiological constraint or trauma they've experienced or, you know, the inheritance of, uh, kind of psychological profile that makes it difficult or even impossible to do uh, 
what other people might be able to do that we cannot judge or condemn because their limitations are just as gifted as their capacities, as are my limitations and my capacities. Mm -hmm. And so the relationship between grace and work there is not an opportunity to beat each other over the head with whichever one we think somebody ought to be invoking at any particular moment, but to seek out a relationship with the giver to understand how those gifts were given, why they were given to us, and how the giver wants them to be exercised and used. And so I think I, I try in the book to break down what I think is maybe a particular Latter-day Saint preoccupation with this notion that agency is an intrinsic ability and suggest instead that what the Book of Mormon teaches is that agency is a gift. And when we recognize its giftedness, we get past some of that theological obstacle that the tension between grace and work sometimes creates for us. That's beautiful. Um, on the one hand, uh, I mean, you've, you've certainly convinced me as a reader that this is a, a truly an organizing theme uh, for this section of the Book of Mormon. On the other hand, it's kind of remarkable in a way, because given what we know about the narrative, we're not we might be a little shocked that Moroni is seeing generosity and gifts all over the place. Yeah, he's been through a chaotic collapse. He's lost everything and everyone. There's a kind of solitude and loneliness that marks this. And 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 we see the fingerprints, the the maybe the residue better, the residue of that life in his lack of clarity. He's really clear about some things, but we're a little surprised that he's talking about gifts, given the hand-wringing he does over lots of things. He, he, he's a complex mix himself. So how does that, that hand-wringing side of Moroni relate to a kind of spiritual eye that's been trained on God's generosity? It's a great question, and I think it adds to the power and the poignancy of his testimony about God's generosity, is that he's living a life that looks you know, so bereft of so many of the things that we would take for granted. Yeah. Including the very church community that he's describing so lovingly he doesn't have. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. I think one of the things that Moroni does, and, and you actually see it in some ways more clearly in other places in the Book of Mormon where Moroni appears, but that he turns the trouble and the lack into a gift sort of, it's related to what I was saying before, which is that, you know, in recognizing that grace and work are, you know, both gifts, they're both given to us uh, in, in individualized proportion, you recognize that limitations can have divine purpose. Uh, and so this is the Moroni that appears at the end of the Book of Ether to say in 1227, you know, that when we come unto God, he will show us our weaknesses and he will make weak things strong. And that in the process of, actually, um, Rosalind Welch always corrects me, it's not weaknesses in the plural, it's weakness singular. <laughs> um, but that that limitation is in fact a means to a divine end. Uh, and that Moroni sees, in fact, you see it again in, in the, or previous to Ether, in, at the end of the Book of Mormon, the you know, the interior Book of Mormon, when he says in chapter 9, you know, don't condemn me for my mistakes. Thank God that you've seen my mistakes so that you can learn to be more wise than I've been. You know, he sees possibility in the absence, possibility in the lack. And so I think he sees the generosity of God and the givingness of God, not just in the obvious sort of largesse or munificence of God, but even in the, the ways in which God denies us certain things or doesn't give us the, you know, the, the capacity that we wish we had. Uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons why Moroni is so able to see the generosity of the divine, because he sees it on both sides of the equation, both in what we have and in what we don't. Uh, and that through the grace of God, those both those can be transformed into instruments of light and truth. It's uh, it's interesting to me that in in Moroni 10, when he's reflecting back on, he sort of has this this one moment to say, all right, what does all of this mean? You know, what has been the message of this record? He says, I will show you that the tender mercies of the Lord 
have been present, right? Um, he says, I, I, I invite you to see as you look, as you read this, speaking to the reader, uh, that the Lord has been merciful. Um, and for a guy that's living in the ashes of his own, you know, world, to say that the message of this book is one of mercy and hope is a powerful witness to all of us when we feel like maybe we're living in the ashes of our own situation about uh, how a wise and good God might in fact be using those difficult circumstances to ours and others eternal benefit. It's wonderful and it's timely um, for all of us living in a year that has given us a bit of a uh, a tutoring in chaos. Uh, it, I think it's a really timely point you make. I want to loop back to a couple of the points that you made when you were describing our the sequence. Uh, again, you 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 know that um, Baroni pauses um, to convey sacrament prayers for a community that he no longer has, and so he's he's definitely thinking. Uh, <laughs> about about future a future we when he says we uh, it's a we that's not present with him uh, and so he's thinking about a future kind of communion there but he gives us the sacrament prayers you you write about those with a with a with a kind of insight that I wanted to kind of plumb here together you you note something about their repetition and uh, I mean, these are set. These are these are recited. These these don't change. We don't have the benefit of a kind of creative performance of these. We're we're fastidious about the way these prayers go. But you see meaning there, and you see meaning in his recording of them, his transmission of them, his care of them. There's something about this that that strikes you. Talk us through um, the possible meanings of the sacrament and these prayers for the modern church? I think that the careful repetition of those prayers does at least three things, and probably more, but, uh, but I'll mention three. One is that it, it uh, does what Phil Barlow described as Joseph Smith's great project in a wonderful article that I cite every chance I get, uh, which is to mend a fractured reality as we, we live in a world in which God's family is divided at so many dimensions. Um, we usually think about that as division of culture or division of gender, our race, all of which is kind of painfully present and crucial to attend to. But we're also divided along axes of time and space. And what a ritual does in part, one that's kind of carefully preserved, is to break down that temporal division. So when we carefully preserve that prayer, we make sure that we're repeating it word for word across time. It is a kind of defiance of historical change. It's as if to say, for all the things that do change over time, and as a historian, I'm trained to pay attention to historical change. You know as well as I do that you know, the, in the academic study of religion, that's the definition of history, is change over time. Yeah. And, uh, and it's often where sort of historians see themselves as at odds with religion. Religion's about eternal verities and history's about things that evolve. But in this ritual, even as it acknowledges other things that might change in our church life and, uh, and in the world around us, it's to say that at this moment, when we partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we are connecting across time. That I am hearing the same prayer that Moroni recorded, which is the same prayer that Jesus instructed his disciples to use. So that's a way to say, you know, I might be living in a world that is radically different from ancient Lamanites and Nephites. But for a moment on Sunday morning, we're in this together. And we are the family of God. And those barriers of time that separate the children of our heavenly parents are broken down by our careful preservation of this prayer. Or the emblems themselves, you know, a crust of bread. Suddenly I'm back, you know, in the upper room at the Last Supper, connecting with ancient apostles who ate the same thing for the same purpose. 
So there aren't many moments when we get to do that, when we get to leap across millennia and say, my sisters and brothers of an entirely different era, we are part of the same covenant. And, and that's a beautiful thing, you know, for a few moments on a Sunday morning. So that's part of the careful preservation and you know, repetition of that. I also believe in this sort of power of what we sometimes refer to as Aristotelian virtue ethics, which is that we become something through the repetitive practice of something. And if we think about, you know, the sacrament as an act of devotion, as an act of confession, as an act of covenant making, that when I repetitively do that over and over again, I am becoming a more thoughtful, more devoted, more covenant keeping kind of person. That the repetitive action is in fact the process by which a virtue is formed. Uh, and that this requires a kind of layering of ritual performativity, to use the post-structural term, in which we are formed as new selves through this process. Uh, and I, I think there's a real power to that. I use the, uh, the scholar, uh, anthropologist of, uh, of religion, Saba Mahmoud, as one of my kind of thinking partners in this discussion of the sacrament in the book, who uses this sort of Aristotelian notion of virtue ethics or you know, what, what she calls the habitus to describe this as sort of, you know, she's, she, her, her, her ethnography is of Muslim women in Egypt, but what she's saying is they are engaging in their ritual practice, not as an expression of who they are, but as a means to become who they want to be. Mm. And that requires repetition. It requires frequency. Yeah. Um, and she, you know, Mahmoud describes this, you know, in a way that's sort of like, you know, a pianist doing scales, right? You develop a kind of muscle memory of the self, muscle memory of the soul, yeah. uh, through this process. And that's why we get up every Sunday morning and come do it in the same way a, 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 a pianist gets up and does the scales. Not because we think the scales are, you know, the whole concerto. They're not. You know, the, the ordinance is not the whole gospel. And this is what Moroni, you know, even as he emphasizes them, kind of warns us against. But they are crucial to us becoming the kind of people that can play the whole concerto. Yeah. Uh, and there's no shortcut to that. So that's part of the repetition of this. And then the third sort of implication uh, of the sacrament and, and its repetitive nature is that in the repetition in the in the frequency of it um, I get the chance to uh, develop a kind of language of connection with God I, I get to use this physical act as a way to express my hopes uh, and any relationship is benefited by mo more means of communication and the ritual provides us with another set of symbolic expressions to our to our Heavenly Father that, that forge an even tighter bond. So, you know, that's a lot going on in 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Uh, and the, the problem is its frequency and its memorization and, and the things that allow it to play these important roles also run the risk of us thoughtlessly, mindlessly going through this. And, and that destroys everything I just described, right? It's got to be done thoughtfully. And so this is the disciples challenge, which is to be both carefully repetitive, fastidiously careful in the way that we do this Sunday after Sunday after Sunday without getting mindless about it. And that's tough. Uh, that's tough. But it is, I think, the the recipe for the full power and possibility of that part of our ritual lives. Well, and, and you have my thanks because you've slowed me down. Uh, and that's that's a gift of the book for me is just that you've slowed me down with the sacrament by you slowing down with Moroni and thinking hard about uh, why he pauses there. Your pause there has slowed me down. So I'm, I'm excited for folks to have that. You said something in your response about stepping across the millennia and it reminded me of, 
your depiction of Moroni in a way, because in, in your hands, Moroni uh, stands kind of at the intersection of the past and the present and the future. Um, he's consumed by his people's past, right? And, and the lessons that it has. He's, he's wringing his hands in the present. He's, uh, he's, he, he's worried about the effects of his writing and so on uh, for the future. So he, he's kind of uh, in communion with folks who aren't there in the past and folks who aren't there that will be there in the future. And so he's kind of outside time himself. And you, you describe this as a kind of creative dynamism that uh, it's about him pulling from the past and getting insight in the present for the purpose of a better future. And for you, that's kind of, uh, that's a model of sorts. You, you link this to restoration itself. I wonder if you could talk through that for just a minute, uh, the, the, this kind of, of careful attention to the past, but openness to insight now, that that, that dynamism, your word, is what restoration is. Uh, I've just prefaced this by saying that one of the important realities of the Book of Moroni that I think too often we rush over and disregard is that it's addressed to Lamanites. I mean, this book has an audience. Uh, yeah. And there is uh, just tremendous meaning in that for me about Moroni's belief that time can work wonders because he's on the run from these people that he's writing to you know and as as we understand when we read moroni 9 you know his father's letter lamanites have lots of good reasons to hate nephites i mean the nephites have done some terrible terrible unspeakable i'd say unspeakable except that mormon wrote them down and wanted us to confront them <laughs> they've been spoken yeah yeah they are uh terrible things so here here's this group of people that have very little reason to trust the message and all kinds of reasons to hate the messenger and here's moroni thinking i'm going to do this because i believe someday this is going to work if someday this will be received and time matters and it might take a long time you know god's gifts sometimes take a very long time to reach their fulfillment um you know, just ask uh abraham you know um ask uh ask christ himself who's still waiting on us to really come to appreciate what he did two thousand years ago or what he did before the creation of the earth so time, time matters and time can be part of God's tool set for affecting the redemption of his family. So that's, that's point number one. And, and I, think, I think we only see that when we pause to notice that Moroni is writing to a particular people here. Uh, and the rest of us get the benefit of sort of the, the beauty of that relationship between him and his Lamanite kin. So that's point number one. Point number two uh, is that Moroni does some interesting things here, suggesting that the future is going to be different from his present. One of them is that, you know, in describing the conferral of the gift of the Holy Ghost, or, or that is the authority to confer the gift, the conferral of the authority to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost. He does something that actually his father does in Third Nephi too. They both do it, which is to say, you know, there's some things that Jesus just said to the disciples. You know, these, these this apostolic twelve that are described as the disciples, uh, or you know, categorized as the disciples. But I'm going to tell you what he said to them, and that's a really interesting authorial move to say, okay, Jesus reserved this knowledge for the, the these twelve disciples, but for some reason, Moroni thinks it's important that we all know what he said. As if to say, there will come a day when you are going to need this knowledge too. And, and it turns out that what, he, what Jesus said to those disciples is, you've got to be spiritually prepared to be a leader uh, and a source of, of divine power in the lives of the people that you serve. Well, the, the whole message of the restoration, that is this dispensation, is that that's applicable to all of us. 
I mean, w- one of the most beautiful symbols that I know of in this regard is, you know, the, the, the symbolism of the endowment. And there was once an era for much of God's work in the world where there was one high priest on the face of the earth, one high priest designated by certain vestments, certain you know clothing items, and we live in a dispensation when every woman and man who passes through the temple wears the robes of the high priesthood and uh, and is ordained to be a priestess or a priest, and so you know you take this sort of ancient world in which these gifts were reserved to a very small number and the restoration just blows that up. And, and we wrestle as a people and we wrestle for good reason. We have our own painful history with, you know, how expansive we've been with those offerings of authority and, you know, leadership. And we're still in the middle of that. We're still in that process. But, but the, at the core of it, something remarkable has happened with the restoration where that you know, that singular high priest is now represented by, you know, women and men across the kingdom. And so when Moroni says, well, you know, Jesus said this thing to these select few, but I'm going to make sure that you all know what he said. It's just almost as if for me that he's anticipating that, that element of the restoration. And one of the things that's striking to me about Latter-day Saint experience and doctrine and culture is that unlike, say, a kind of Protestantized move to a priesthood of all believers, which really universalizes the priesthood by lowering its distinctiveness, by saying, you know, it's it's really just, you know, the power of faith, power of prayer. I shouldn't say just. Those are really meaningful, you know, significant things. But it doesn't have that sort of priestly distinctiveness of office. What the Restoration does is say, okay, we're going to maintain this really high-level notion of what priesthood might signify, and we're going to start distributing it in these radically expansive ways. And again, we're, we're, we're agonizing and wrestling over, you know, what that means and how broad is that, you know, distribution and, and all these things that I think God expects us to prayerfully and thoughtfully deal with and wrestle with. But you can't ignore the fact that something quite remarkable has happened there theologically. And that, in fact, it's anticipated by Moroni's record in so many ways that we that everybody who picks up that book um, woman, man, child reads this instruction that was once reserved. So I think this is sort of Moroni's way of saying, all right, as the prophet, I'm going to look back 400 years and recover what Jesus says. I'm living 400 years later and I'm going to, you know, ponder it and record it and think about it. And I'm doing so because I believe that hundreds of years from now, this knowledge is going to be important to a wider group of people as if to say, you need both what I have to offer and you're going to need it in the distinctive context of your time and place. And so the restoration as the sort of convergence of dispensations, a place where you know new light breaks forth upon ancient truths. You know, this idea that Moroni has something to offer us, but it's not the same as the world that he lived in, nor is it the same as the world 400 years earlier that he's trying to recover, but that the convergence of these things is the fullness of times. And that he had a sense, I don't, it's hard to know exactly how prescient he was, you know, how far did that prophetic gift go? How much did he really see of, you know, what our world and what our version of the church looks like? But he clearly had a sense that it was going to be different, but different in a way that would still benefit from what he had to offer. Wonderful. Uh, a final question for you. Uh, you've been wrestling with Moroni, this text, uh, for over a year and a half. Uh, you've been thinking and writing, and uh, it's been a sweet kind of uh, communion editorially for me, frankly, uh, to, be, uh, to have a front row seat uh, to watch you uh, wrestle with this text. What's changed for you? Now that the book is uh, done, it's uh, being typeset as we speak, maybe. How are you different? What's changed for you in this, uh, in this stretch of wrestling with uh, these marvelous concluding chapters of the Book of Mormon? Well, really, all, all the things I've mentioned, quite literally, I think maybe every single thing that I've mentioned in this conversation, 
has been a kind of new a new realization for me, or at least a new appreciation for me uh, of these truths that I'm now utterly convinced by. You know, the, the giftedness, the importance of recognizing the giftedness of agency in addition to the giftedness of grace. That's a that's a, been a profoundly personally meaningful theological breakthrough for me. Um, the the role of our ritual lives in relation to the higher truths of the gospel. It, it I, I was let's get too personal here, but uh, I was having my Sunday night come follow me discussion with my own children, and began to kind of wax verbose here, which usually causes <laughs> them to roll their eyes. But I found myself drawing from my my study of Moroni to, to talk about why the sacrament matters. Uh, and I, I could have never had that conversation with the people that mean the most to me in the whole world. You know, I want my children to understand this, why we go to church on a Sunday morning, why, why, it, why it does matter whether we blow it off or not. You know, and how do you explain that in a world like today's world? that Moroni suddenly gave me a way to have that conversation. And I, I would not have appreciated that gift from Moroni if I had not spent a lot of time trying to understand him, trying to understand his book. So, you know, from, from the importance of the ordinances to, you know, the gifts of the spirit uh, and everything in between, you know, the, the, the power of God's gifts of what we lack um, you name it, it's been, a, it's been an opportunity for me to change as I've thought about the theological messages of the Book of Moroni. Well, David, you've, uh, you've given gifts uh, to us uh, in the form of this book. You're a, you're a busy man, and, and yet you've consecrated yours uh, for the good of the saints, and uh, I'm grateful for it. And grateful for your time today. Thanks for uh, thanks for the conversation. Uh, thanks for the book. Can't wait to see it in the world. Well, I'll always be grateful to you, Spencer, personally, and to the Maxwell Institute institutionally for conceiving of the series and for giving me the great gift of being a part of it. Thanks a lot. Take care. That was David F. Holland of Harvard Divinity School and Spencer Fluman of the Maxwell Institute talking about Moroni, a brief theological introduction. You can learn more about that book and the series at mi.byu.edu slash brief. And before we go, let's check out a review of the month. Here we are. Mimi Sundwall said that she found the podcast after listening to some lectures by Terrell Gibbons on the Institute's YouTube channel. That's great. It must have come up as a recommended video. She said, one of the many blessings from the COVID-19 pandemic is my discovery of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Every episode I've listened to has awakened my understanding, increased my faith, and left me hungry for more. The messages I've found here have expanded the scope of my pondering on truth, my study of the scriptures, my vision of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for the life work of these scholars who've helped me find what I wasn't aware I was missing. I hope everyone I share this with will come in here. Well, thank you for that. We, we hope people will come in here too, Mimi. Thank you so much. And speaking of other people coming to here, I want to say hello to Amy Nelson, who recently joined the Maxwell Institute podcast Completist Club, which anyone can join simply by listening to every episode of the show. That's over 120 episodes. Amy emailed me to let me know when she finished, and she said, I feel like I'm a different person than when I started, and that's great to hear. I feel different as well. If there are more completists out there, let me know. You can email me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Until next time, I'm Blair Hodges. Thanks for listening.